Welcome to the Performance and Accountability Board uh, for May. I'm going to start with introductions. My name is Mark Shelford and I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset. And I'm going to ask Sally in a moment to introduce herself, but uh, she is the Director of Performance and Accountability and, and the fact that you are watching this today is because of the great work that she put in as a brainchild and made actually happen. So Sally, thank you for that. Uh, You're very welcome. Please do <laughs> introduce yourself. Thank you. Sally Fox, Director of Performance and Accountability, the PCC's office. Thank you. And Chief Constable. Yes, yeah, Sarah Crew, Chief Constable, Avon and Smith, please. And Deputy Chief Constable. Uh, good afternoon, Nikki Watson, Deputy Chief Constable. During uh, the meeting, I and my Director of Performance and Accountability will be putting questions uh, to the Chief Constable and the Deputy Chief Constable. This is one of the ways that we hold the Chief Constable to account in a transparent way. This meeting allows everybody to be able to understand how Avon and Somerset Police are performing. The first agenda item today will focus on the quarterly performance report. The report looks at both the national policing priorities and also the performance against my police and crime plan. This time it focuses on priority one of the plan, preventing and fighting crime. And I would like to start by looking at the homicide data. Since April last year, the homicide rate in Avon and Somerset has been higher than other most similar forces. Domestic homicide accounts for a large proportion of the total homicides within Avon and Somerset. Um, among the thousand of domestic abuse crimes that happen each year nationally, can you tell us about how you identify risks and preventing behaviour escalating to the point of homicide? Thank you. So I think it's first it's right that I explain that every domestic homicide that happens nationally but in Avon and Somerset area attracts a statutory uh, multi-agency review called a domestic homicide review and a core purpose of that review is to um, identify opportunities for prevention but also to look for ways to improve our response to domestic abuse because clearly we want to prevent homicides from happening in the first place but a lot of insight can be gained from looking at what's happened it sharpens, pra sharpens practice um, but the way we do the prevention um, is through the use of a tried and tested risk assessment tool it's called DASH that stands for domestic abuse stalking harassment and honor based violence assessment and that's a structured question set um, and there's a lot of empirical research behind every single question and the value of each question. And what that does is it enables frontline professionals, in this case police officers, police staff, at the scene of a domestic abuse to assess the risk of serious harm to the victim so that they can then access the right support as soon as possible to prevent escalation. Now the tool doesn't just look at the incident before the officer, it takes into account history of a relationship, um, the history of the perpetrator, um, any vulnerabilities, including the effect on children who may be part of that um, situation, but also any re red flags. So things like non-fatal strangulation can be a significant red flag for something that may go on to escalate significantly. Um, now that tool is absolutely vital in um, ensuring in a fast and accurate way we've got a good assessment of what the risk is, not just for us but for other professionals in other agencies. We've all got a part to play in preventing things from escalating and making sure victims have the best services um, available to them and as I say children and other vulnerable people who may be part of that situation. Now the tool generates assessments um, of high risk, medium risk or standard risk and the response that happens um, is determined by that so you'd expect um, even with a standard risk assessment that a victim with their consent would be able to access the services of an independent domestic violence advocate um, and also information would be shared with GPs, with schools if there are children as well so other professionals can be on the lookout. But when you get to high risk, um, 
you'll see employ automatic allocation of one of those domestic abuse advisors, investigation <laughs> by specialist investigators in CID, um, direct involvement of our lighthouse safeguarding unit, more of that in a second, but also most cases in that category are discussed in a multi-agency risk, um, risk assessment conference so that we can plan together for supporting that victim, that those vulnerable people, um, and preventing further escalation. Now, whatever grading has happened, we do expect the first investigators at the scene to consider what immediately needs to put in place to reduce risk. So that could be as simple as an arrest. Um, it could be um, extra security around that premises. It could be things like a civil order to curtail the behaviour of the perpetrator, something called a domestic violence um, perpetrator notice. We could go to a civil court to obtain that. Um, so immediately things are put in place, but that ongoing risk assessment is really overseen by the LSU, the Lighthouse Safeguarding Unit that I mentioned before. Um, and that ranges from daily triage of every domestic abuse incident that happens where they put a second eye on that risk assessment to check we've got it right, right through to um, being part of the MAROC process and instigating that where we share with um, partner agencies, signpost, refer for support, etc. Um, so if we do that properly, we do that consistently, we should prevent these incidents happening. Clearly, sometimes they happen when we've had no previous knowledge. And that's where we get the learning from those um, domestic homicide reviews. What's really important, we've learned though, is that officers and staff at the scene, um, it's important they understand the dynamics um, and the nature of domestic abuse and how it, it operates, the psychology of it. And one of the things that we've done um, recently um, very much championed by Chief Inspector Sharon Baker, um, who has a national profile in this area. She's been very open about her own experiences of domestic abuse. Sharon, working with a charity called Safe Lives, has um, um, rolled out, delivered a programme called DA, Domestic Abuse Matters for Avon in Somerset. Um, that's been um, now delivered to nearly 2,000 of our frontline professionals. Um, it's also been attended by partners who are independent domestic violence advisors and our colleagues in CPS because partnership working is critical here. Um, so that officers go into completing those risk assessments with a full understanding of the dynamics. Um, we've also, through Sharon's work and the work of the programme, established a cohort of officers called DA influencers. So they work within frontline teams, but they've had net extra knowledge and skills um, supported by Safe Lives so that they can be champions, but points of reference um, within teams. And they can also highlight good practice, give some feedback, um, but also maybe identify the signs of maybe empathy, fatigue and, and burnout amongst officers who see lots of this. Um, but also colleagues who may be experiencing trauma in their own lives and be able to support. Um, as senior leaders, we've, we've also been through an aspect of the programme called Sustaining the Change, and we're now in the process of embedding all that learning into our core um, learning curriculum. So this is an ongoing process. It needs continuous refreshing. As we learn more, we need to do more, but that's how we're trying really hard to prevent these uh, events escalating. I've just got one follow-up. Um, question to this uh, that you might that the front the, the first responding police officers mm -hmm. might be attending something completely different apart from domestic abuse there may be no obvious signs of domestic abuse other than controlling behavior as part of their training and their mm -hmm. identification do they are those trigger points that they then hook down and start making an assessment about domestic abuse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we, we want officers to have professional curiosity. So the DA Matters programme enables them to be able to see the signs and the triggers, but coercive and co controlling behaviour is an offence now, so it's very much covered in the programme. So um, they can identify those signs. And even if a victim isn't ready in that moment, to disclose that they can also signpost into some of those other services so we would also 
um, through other ways of risk assessment, be making sure our colleagues in the Lighthouse Safeguarding Unit are aware of those concerns. So again, we can share information with other partners because they may have seen signs too that complete the picture. Chief Constable, thank you. Um, I now want to change track, um, turning to drug crime, uh, which a lot of people have spoken to me about, and there's real concern. We spoke three months ago about the positive increase in drug disruptions. However, in the most recent quarter, there's been a noticeable decline. Uh, do you understand what is causing this, and what assurance can you give me that this is not the start of a downward trend in that disruption? Yes, um, so I think it's right to explain what a disruption is. Um, it's, a, it's a term that's used in the management of organised crime groups um, and it's a law enforcement um, intervention, if you like, that impacts the effectiveness of an organised crime group. So a drug disruption is very much those law enforcement actions which impact upon the networks who supply and traffic controlled drugs. Um, now they don't just involve traditional enforcement, what we call pursue activity, so traditional arrests and prosecutions. Um, but they also encompass things to prevent um, organised crime groups operating, um, to protect people who are vulnerable to being exploited by um, organised crime groups. We see that in county lines, um, so-called county lines. Um, or to create a hostile environment so um, organised crime groups don't get to take a hand. So those are called prevent, protect and prepare disruptions as well. And we measure all of those. Um, now, the, the, in Avon and Somerset, the pursue disruptions, which cause the spikes and fluctuations in numbers, come primarily through um, long-term proactive planned operations led by the regional organised crime unit, our own specialist CID team, or our operation remedy team and a, 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 a core function of remedy is to specialise in the disrupt, disruption and dismantling, the disruption of the dangerous drug networks that have that term county lines. So we do all of those types of organised crime groups. Now um, the other types of prepare, prevent and um, protect are very much done by our neighbour policing teams with working schools, early intervention teams and our integrated offender management teams. But there's a general rhythm to those, particularly those pursue operations. They're often months, sometimes even years of work in the making. They often use covert policing tactics. They often involve extremely complex issues such as human trafficking, vulnerable victims, um, and they tend to come to fruition altogether in one go in large scale, what we call executive action. Um, and that's where the, gen the disruptions are generated in one fell swoop. What then follows is months and months and months of investigation, obviously, um, leading to prosecutions in court cases further down the line. Um, there's a huge investment of resource and capability in doing that. Um, and it's very much worth it because if you can dismantle an organised crime group, the amount of harm that you prevent is really significant. Um, but much of that work is necessarily unseen. Um, it's either investigative or it's covert. We only see the outcomes. Now, when we see high spikes and fluctuations in disruptions, it's usually because one of those operations is coming to fruition. There are certain times when we'll see that. So we have operations such as the Southwest Regional Drugs Operation, which we also call Operation Scorpion we see a spike when that activity happens. There are also um, operations that we, we, we complete with other forces as part of national action or bilateral. So in the last week, we've done action with the Metropolitan Police in East Bristol, looking at county lines drug networks, where we intensify activity in a short term. The spikes that we will have been seeing um, in previous quarters will be down to those type of operations. We'll certainly see a spike in the next quarter because of the activity I've just talked about that happened in, in last week. I have looked at our baseline disruption activity to see where the, the, the stable line is. Do we need to intervene? So in answer to your question, I'm happy that we are within what we expect to be. I don't expect to see any reduction um, 
in, in the, the disruption activity overall. And there are several reasons I can be confident about that. One, our Operation Remedy team last year were um, very much supplementing our core CID team. Um, as through 2022, we've been rebuilding our CID strength through our new offices. They now have, that, that's eased, they've now got greater time and focus on to focus on drug supply disruption. We're also seeing offices move into Operation Remedy and move out, and that's increasing our proactivity. So we've seen an increase in recent months in intelligence-led, and I'll be careful to say that, intelligence-led stop and search, which is a sign of that. And we're yet to see the, the, the growth of our neighbourhood level proactive teams, which again, um, as the, 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 the numbers of officers kind of come out of their training, we're going to be able to create more capacity to be able to do some of that work. Um, we are going into the summer and it will mark um, the fifth um, Southwest Drugs operation. This time over in Somerset will be playing a leading role. Um, you know, we hope to see record levels of disruptions of all kinds. Um, and that's what we're planning for. So, so I hope that in future um, meetings, when we focus on this aspect of performance, we're going to see a spike around the summertime as well of high numbers of disruptions. Chief Constable, thank you. Um, I, uh, it's not a surprise to you that I will be looking at this closely to make sure that we are, in fact, continuing to do these disruptions. And I do accept uh, that things have changed and that people are moving, which is good news, and I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, and I will watch. Um, this next rotation of Operation Scorpion very closely uh, to look for the success. Um, Sally, turning to you. Thank you. I'd like to talk about uh, male violence against women and girls. In the last year, the number of recorded crimes related to domestic abuse and sexual offences has decreased. Um, now, this could be due to proactive and preventative work undertaken, but this decline could also be caused by loss of confidence in police, which is deterring victims from reporting. Uh, what are you doing to ensure that victims of these types of crimes will continue to report to Avon and Somerset Police? Okay. Well, increasing trust and confidence is our top priority as an organisation. There's much work ongoing, or you've touched upon it in previous meetings, about culture, leadership, transparency. But male violence against women and girls accounts for a quarter of all recorded crime. Um, so if we're going to increase trust and confidence, we can't do it without effectively tackling um, uh, addressing this area effectively, whether that happens actually in our community or indeed in our own organisation. Um, I'm going to focus on um, Operation Soteria Bluestone for this question because we're the pioneer force for it. It started here in Avon in Somerset. It's National Police Chiefs Council led, it's Home Office funded um, and it's aimed at transforming the way in which police respond to offences of rape and serious sexual offences. And Rape disproportionately affects women and girls um, and it's almost always the result of male violence and it's a totemic offence, I think, for um, the confidence of women and girls in the criminal justice system and in the police. So I always say if we can tackle this, we can build confidence overall. Now, our Bluestone team is the pathfinder for that new approach um, nationally. Um, it's got a new approach, helped and shaped with uh, collaboration through academics, it's suspect focused, it's victim engaged, it's trauma informed and there's a lot I could say about it. Um, but I'm going to let the results speak for themselves. So as of April, um, we've seen more than double the volume of rape charges in the last 12 months. So the previous 12 months there were 69, the most recent 12 months 141. Our rate charge rate is more than doubled in the same time period, from 4% to 8%. Not enough, we know, but a doubling nevertheless. We are now in the top quartile for positive outcome rates for rape and serious sexual offences, having been previously bottom quartile 24 months ago. And for the latest quarter's results, so July to September 2022, on the national CJS, or Criminal Justice System Scorecard, we had the third highest um, adult rate charge in the country. Now, we believe that what we're learning for Soteria Bluestone has the potential to improve our response to all male violence against women and girls' offences. The dynamics are the same, and actually the problems in rape that we're starting to overcome are the most difficult. So, combined with the DA Matters programme that I talked about earlier on, um, 
I believe that we can really inspire women and girls and indeed men and boys who suffer these issues to come forward to report, to have confidence that they can access both um, criminal justice in terms of outcome but procedural justice to feel that they've been listened to, involved and treated well throughout the process. It's good to hear as well about looking at that best practice being shared across other time types. One of the most common topics uh, that our communities talk about to me when I go and visit them and um, I have engagements is antisocial behaviour. A year ago you launched a new service standard to improve how um, you respond to antisocial behaviour. However, the victim satisfaction rate has not improved despite the new standard um, and there are apparently 14% fewer incidents to respond to. This seems very strange. Why is this? So uh, I would like to answer this question. Um, so I should rightly point out we have seen a reduction in incidents but that reduction is primarily driven by some reductions in specific types of antisocial behaviour, which is nuisance and environmental antisocial behaviour. That's a positive indication. It's a good reflection on the work that's going on in this area. Um, but we haven't seen that same reduction in the levels of personal antisocial behaviour. Um, that's where there's direct, a direct human victim, as it were, to the antisocial behaviour. And actually, the category of antisocial behaviour that the service standard is, is designed designed specifically for. So uh, <coughs> we've not seen um, the improvement in victim satisfaction that we're aiming for um, uh, and those figures remain stable at the moment so we have more work to do. Uh, the numbers surveyed are, are relatively small when you compare them with the volumes of, of antisocial behaviour but um, it's important that we use the insight that we gain from those um, surveys to make improvements. So under the um, service standard that you talk about, we commit to have a local officer from the victim's neighbourhood team to call that each victim, each and every victim back after they've suffered from antisocial behaviour. And the purpose of those calls is to make sure that we've accurately recorded the crimes um, and the victims correctly, that we're gathering all of the available evidence that there, that there could be in respect of the um, the behaviour and the, uh, what's taken place, and also any intelligence that we can use to disrupt further antisocial behaviour or individual offenders, and uh, make the most of using the antisocial behaviour legislation. So we recognise that we need to be consistent, we need to be effective across our teams, and um, to get the uh, improvement that we need. And so we're, we're working hard to embed this discipline across all of our neighbourhood teams on a force-wide basis. Um, we've got internal scrutiny and improvement panels um, and one of those is our antisocial behaviour strategic working group. Um, that group is looking to implement change, to track progress, to build on successes and to continue to push ahead. Uh, I'm really confident that we will see the improvement, particularly in victim satisfaction, as we move forward, and it's something that we're really closely monitoring. Well, Dr. Chief Counsel, that's great, but when are we going to see that improvement? I think we will, we will start to see that improvement coming through in you know the next, the next month or so. Certainly in six months' time, I would expect to see a significant difference. Very good. I, I will be monitoring it. Um, now turning to agenda item two, these are issues that the public have contacted me about. Uh, recently I received a number of uh, contacts about rural crime. Um, the concerns raised by the public support what I am seeing in the data. In the last year there has been an increase in rural crime, but an obvious decree, decrease in positive outcomes. Has our rural crime team, or rural affairs team, uh, been growing as planned? That's question one. And then, and why have there been so few detections in the last year? So um, the uplifting officer numbers has uh, enabled us to invest in the rural crime team. 
and our plan is to grow that team by an additional two constables. That will bring the overall dedicated team to one sergeant, four constables and, and a PCSO. But we have not been able to re re release that growth to date. Um, I, I checked this morning and the process is, has, com has commenced and I would expect to see the first person in post early in the autumn. Um, and the reasons for that, as I think we probably have discussed at uh, previous meetings, um, is the, the rapid growth in our officer numbers over the last three years has created some stresses and strains. Um, we have a large number of new people joining us, which is a fantastic opportunity, but all of those people will join our frontline teams and they will need to learn the craft of becoming a police officer. They'll, they'll learn their skills. And what we have to do is we have to retain some of our experienced officers in those teams so that they can tutor those officers and bring them up to the skill levels that we would all expect and need of our police officers. That's, that's meant keeping some of those experienced officers in patrol and neighbourhoods uh, while we do that. But we have now got to the point where we can start uh, releasing them uh, to fulfil our commitment to grow the Rural Affairs Unit. Good. Um, <laughs> and I'm also keen that the, the team should be fully supported with equipment and surveillance equipment, whether it be uh, organic um, drones um, and also uh, night surveillance equipment to support them in their activities. Uh, regarding the crime levels and the performance, um, we, we know that rural crime um, takes place mainly in Somerset and the rest of it is split sort of equally between um, Baines, Gloucestershire and North Somerset. The principal types of crime, which everybody may not be aware of, is thefts of and from uh, vehicles and machinery, and that goes from something as small as a chainsaw to something as large as a £70,000 tractor. Criminal damage is... Uh, oh, it's going up. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> yes. um, the criminal damage associated with those thefts and the trespass, uh, thefts of livestock, poaching and hair coursing, uh, rural cannabis grows is, is a big issue. Um, wildlife crime and hunting offences, modern day slavery often happens in rural communities and the animal rights uh, offences. So um, uh, as I said a lot of that happens in the Somerset area of which I was the commander for several years and I'm delighted to say that since then we've really improved on how we've been able to define the rural crime picture much more accurately by better flagging, keyword searching and use of technology. So um, this has inflated the numbers of rural crime per month and we're now receiving, or in 2021 we were receiving about 60 per month. Um, but the increase, I, I must stress, is as a result of more accurate classification rather than an increase in prevalence. Um, but we still know that there is crime that's underreported and people are not coming forward and I would encourage people to let us know if they think they've been a victim of crime. <coughs> so um, the bigger uh, volume means that the detection challenge is all the greater. Um, historically detections have been low and this has been reflected nationally. Um, this is due to a number of factors. The, the locations are obviously often quite remote, which means that there aren't um, neighbours that are overseeing what's going on in different properties, witnesses, there's very often very limited CCTV and forensic opportunities and they're just um, quite isolated areas in many occasions, which, which does uh, cause some challenges in relation to trying to identify the offenders. But, um, but there's also lots that we can do to improve the outcomes and, and we're absolutely committed to doing that. Um, so uh, we would try and disrupt, identify and dis disrupt series and that's what, what we can do if people will tell us, tell us everything that's happening because we can often um, put all of that information together to get the overall picture. But we're also doing a lot with our staff to make sure they really understand the impact of rural crime and the importance, for example, of consistently properly recording stolen property and, and the, the details of what's happened. So we have had some successes. Um, quite often, in fact, it's, it's, 
it is um, quite prevalent that we're able to return stolen property. We, we find and seize the stolen property, um, but we're not always able to bring a charge against the offender, but it does mean that the person gets their property back. Um, that wouldn't count as a detection in our figures. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, that, that's a sort of a hidden piece of information, I guess, for the figures don't necessarily portray. And, and we would always say that prevention is better than detection. So um, we continue to absolutely target the known perpetrators of these crimes. Um, and when we have the intelligence and the evidence to do so, we will create a hostile environment so that they can't commit their crime and exploit the rural areas. Well, thank you for that. What I'm looking for is to see those detection rates going up. Um, and again, it's another thing that we'll be monitoring very closely. Now, we're, we've, we've sort of run out of time, but I do want um, a very short and succinct answer to the last question, which is about the Peel report, um, particularly around prevention. And um, this is an area that we need to improve on. Uh, and the constabulary needs to ensure that neighbourhood policing officers have access to structured training as part of preventing of that uh, crime and antisocial behaviour. Please can you tell me what you're going to do to address this particular point, but can you be as succinct as possible? Yes. So in a succinct answer, um, we are focusing the continuous professional development on our staff becoming really effective problem solvers. So that would be, um, um, we've had a working group running to identify all of the opportunities to do that. Um, part of that is our digital um, academy and our platform where our staff can access all sorts of digital content, online courses, webinars, training, um, sort of some horizon scanning that we're doing, and also a link to the academic uh, work that our PCDA students, their dissertations, so lots of online um, material for our staff. In addition to that, we've got three interactive scenario-based paper feed training exercises that all of our neighbourhood staff will be going through. 300 have attended so far already. Um, and we've got some specific training for the supervisors and sergeants, supervisors and sergeants specifically around how they supervise problem solving to get the most effective results that we possibly can. So we're monitoring um, those. We're reviewing the effectiveness of previous problem solving plans, taking the learning out of those and feeding them back in for the staff. Uh, we have a team room set up so that staff can access it if they've got a specific problems to see if somebody's dealt with that somewhere else in the force. So, um, so loads going on. Um, we want to be learning all the time and we're doing that horizon scanning to make sure that there's, there's not good practice that we can bring in from elsewhere and we're, we're continuing to do that. Good. I mean, it's based about um, threat analysis of changing um, crime types. Uh, in that local environment, but it's also about best practice shared with other forces, and I get that. And again, this is something that we will constantly monitor, not least because it's in the Peel report, and we need to show that we're improving uh, in those areas. So, um, thank you, Chief Constable and Deputy Chief Constable and Sally. Um, our next meeting is on the 14th of June at 10:30. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>